Not only that, but that violence is a direct condition, right? It's an, it's an, it's a necessary and sufficient condition, right? So that conflict, which is important, right? Under the parable of the tribes, conflict becomes a sufficient condition for um, identity. Right? If you want to preserve your identity, you have to be engaged in conflict. And the point is, obviously for peace builders and peacekeepers, is to think of a way within a context of the parable of the tribes where you can have preservation of identity without conflict. Right? So obviously that's what peacekeepers and peacemakers um, are attempt on an international level, NGO facilitators are attempting to do, right? How is it within um, a geographic location that identifies, that can be identified or labeled as satisfying the conditions for the parable of the tribes? How is it that we can have a preservation of identity without conflict? Because obviously here, the only way that we preserve our identity is through conflict. And I mean, that's, that's not what we're trying to support. I'm not going to go into responses or answers to that, there are many. Um, in, in this part, I just wanted to introduce the, the notion of the, um, the the parable of the tribes. It's a very important concept, and it's important that uh, you have an understanding of what it means. Okay, so that's that. Huh? Next is uh, the four conditions for state insecurity. Right? So conditions for state insecurity. Again, uh, I'm not suggesting that these conditions are in any sense exhaustive. Exhaustive, there might be more, um, but these are the conditions that Medlarsky introduces in in the piece. Obviously, um, state insecurity is going to come as uh, a direct consequence from the collapse of the state. Right? Right? Pretty obvious. State collapses. The state is fundamentally insecure. Um, in the process of the state collapsing, as we saw before, there's going to be um, vying for political power. Assuming that this political power is hegemonized, one person's going to win, one person's going to lose. The, the um, ethno-political group that attains power, um, political power, is then almost invariably going to use that power to further oppress or even exterminate um, its prior oppositional group, right, its oppositional force. And this cycle is perpetrated, right? The oppositional force finally rises to power, it gains power, it then uses that power to exterminate its former oppressors. I mean, this is what happened Burundi 72, Rwanda 94, right? Um, Tutsi are in power, they use their power to kill Hutu. Hutu are in power, they use their power to kill Tutsi, and so on, and so on, right? It, it, it becomes this sort of cyclical, generational uh, cycle of violence. Um, obviously, the fear of war. Fear of war. Um, fear of war will destabilize the state, right? Um, fear of war would lead to um, insecurity within the state. So, from um, from a national security affairs stance, um, the the perpetual fear of war undermines the stability of security within the state. Right? A state cannot retain um, um, social cohesion with perpetual fear of war. If if the population is consistently fearful that the state is going to be engaged in battle, or is currently engaged in battle, um, social upheaval and revolt is, is, is inevitable. Or, if there's going to be an attempt to suppress revolt or social upheaval, it's going to come at the expense of further dehumanizing the population, right? So, um, obviously an instance of state insecurity. Um, number three is recent defeat in war. And Midlarsky goes through it and gives tons and tons and tons of historical examples. Uh, I'm not going to go through uh, all of the historical examples. I'm not going to go through any of the historical examples. I would recommend that if you're interested, purchase the book, read the chapter, as a, um, read the chapter and use this lecture to supplement your understanding. For me, as a theorist, what's important is the notions, right? the concepts that um, are derived from these very, very broad conceptual um, notions of security and insecurity, because we can use these later 
we can use these con uh, conceptions of security and insecurity and the way that security is preserved, the way that insecurity is, is, um, is uh, spread um, to talk about more complex notions of uh, international peace, international um, de-escalation of war, conflict, and so on, right? Um, and then lastly, number four, major act of war, right? A major act of war. Um, and I, I mean, the, the example that I give here is the destruction of the, Nat, uh, the Nazi state, right? Um, National Socialism failed with the failure of and the defeat of the Nazi party um, in uh, World War II, at the, consequence, at the end of World War II, the entire state collapsed, right? It had to be restructured. Not only did it have to be restructured, but the rest and this is important, right? The restructuring of the state was not a consequence of um, the population, right? The sort of indigenous, if you will, the indigenous population. Um, third world, third world, third party um, intervention became the, the sort of the, uh, the governing mode, right? For state construction, the state was constructed as a consequence of third party, um, third party uh, decision making. So um, obviously, that is the complete destabilization of uh, of the state. Okay, so those are some of the conditions for state insecurity. Again, I don't want to um, go into more detail than that because it's pretty obvious. There is, however, uh, a point that I want to make, and this is a very very interesting point. Um, I'm going to cite. Um, Midlarsky uh, verbatim here. So this is a quote from Midlarsky. Um, he says, quote, a severe, this is important, right, a severe external threat, right? a severe external threat, threat can act to unify a society at least temporarily as long as the threat is still manifest, right? So a severe external threat can serve to unify a society as long as that threat is maintained. But when it diminishes, but when it diminishes or disappears, then muted antagonisms or grievances can surface abruptly. Okay, what does he mean by that, and how does that notion relate to our discussion, our broader, more general discussion on international war and terrorism? Okay, think of it like this, right? Uh, and I think the example he gives is of the uh, the American South um, pre and post civil rights era. Okay, so. We have a threat, we, the United States of America, at that time, have a threat from the former uh, Soviet Union. Insofar as there's an external threat, and it can be any nation, it can be nation A, nation B, it doesn't have to be any particular nation, right? I'm going to keep it general. So there's an external threat that's posed against the entire, the entire state. Um, there were, prior to the external threat, grievances between different parts of the population, right? So these are uh, internal conflicts. So these are internal conflicts, and here's an external threat. In the presence, what Midlarsky is saying, uh, and he actually um, incorporates this idea from um, Lewis uh, Poser in uh, in a book, or actually this is uh, yeah in a book um, in a in a piece that he wrote, the function of social conflict, and all the reference bibliographic information is there, so that you can go uh, do your own research, right? Um, so what ends up happening? What he's saying is, in the presence of a huge external threat, in the presence of a huge external threat the conflicts that we have are suppressed, right? So that will, we'll, uh, we will uh, suppress momentarily our conflicts in the presence of an external threat, right? So we'll put suppression. So in the presence of an external, a, a huge external threat, internal conflicts will be suppressed. Actually, this notion comes out of uh, Carl Schmitt, right? Carl Schmitt um, talks about um, nationalism and, and political identity um, as a consequence of a realized enemy, right? I have some problems with this with this notion. Um, this is not to critique Midlarsky at all, but I personally have some problems with this notion because I know how Schmitt's argument is flawed. I know the weaknesses in this argument, but there is some legitimacy to the claim that 
there's quite a bit of legitimacy to the claim um, that in the presence of an external threat, we suppress our internal conflicts. That's not as um, stringent as a claim as national identity is a consequence of identifying an enemy, which is what Schmidt's saying, which is a far more, which is a far more uh, powerful uh, claim, right?